right, so now we're going to talk about uh, varying genetic parameters. This turns out to be a very interesting subject, uh, uh, much more so than dealing with the environmental parameters, because there are so many variations you can see in genetic parameters, and this is kind of such an interesting subject. So let's talk about this a little bit. So the first thing we'll talk about <clears throat> is how we do single uh, gene knockouts or, or single and double gene knockouts and how we trace uh, the effect of a gene knockout through the GPRs and we, and we set certain fluxes to zero and we constrain the solution space by doing that. And we are very interested in gene essentiality, just see when is growth rate driven to zero, which are the essential genes in a given condition. But there's also a set of other methods that we'll just mention here, is when you don't kill a cell by taking out the gene or incapacitating the function of a gene product, but you still get a viable cell, but there's a phenotype, so there's a change. So it's not to zero. So you try to predict um, what phenotype does a cell take on after you remove a gene or inhibit the gene product with a drug or something like that. So we have essential genes, essential knockouts, and we have non-essential markers that we want to study. And then we'll talk a little bit more about other things like mutations. It's a great interest to look at uh, point mutations, SNPs in the human population as, as an example. Epigenetic effects. This is when um, in a diploid organism, when one of the alleles um, is being silenced by methylation as an example. GWA studies. May not say a lot about that. These are the genome wide association studies. So you have a phenotype and you try to map it onto the genome and you try to find the genes that uh, uh, cause that differential phenotype in, their, in your cohorts. And uh, of course, then there's a lot of interest in looking at um, inborn errors in metabolism. So we'll just mention these applications briefly. Okay, so let's first then talk about um, uh, how we trace. Uh, um, the effect of uh, uh, gene deletion in these models. And I think this is something we showed before. We can, if you delete a gene, you can use the uh, genome uh, to protein to reaction associations to tie that gene to a reaction in the network. So if the gene is gone, that flux has to go to zero. So you add an additional constraint in your model, say this is zero. So that's, that's the concept, that's how you can uh, do that. And uh, GPRs can be pretty complicated, as we uh, talked about. And sometimes when you take a gene out, you may be re removing many reactions, so you can be doing something like this and quite as obvious as shown on the previous slide. But you can always calculate that. If a gene goes out, what functionalities are lost uh, in a network? And I think uh, this is shown here in um, one of Nate Lewis's illustrations. So on top we have uh, two cells, one with a gene and one without a gene. Panel A shows these associations. But from a mathematical standpoint, we'll either have case B or C. Case B is when you had the gene and you have a full solution space. It can calculate an optimal state indicated by the red dot. If the gene is gone, then the solution space shrinks because all the phenotypic states that use that gene product are no longer permissible, and you may calculate now a different optimal state. Uh, the red dot may actually be outside the space, or you can never find the dot in that space that balances the equations that you want to, like growth. Okay, so that's how we do the calculation. So let's look at single uh, cal calculations of single uh, knockouts. So here's the way this is done. So this is done for the core E. coli model, our toy model, where you can be growing it on different substrates. Uh, this uh, top we show for glucose, bottom for uh, succinate, there's two examples. Then you just go down your gene list in the model and remove them one at a time, and you do the optimization pr procedure. And then you can just rack order the outcome of that calculation by the growth rate. And what you get are three types of outcomes. First, you get zero no growth, so those are the essential genes. So if you take them out, your model can't grow. These become predictions of gene essentiality under those conditions. Then you get a group of uh, uh, numbers uh, from the optimization that look like this. They are smaller than what the wild type uh, grows at. So it, removing the gene is predicted to retard growth. So you get a phenotype, but it's not a lethal phenotype. It's a viable phenotype, but it's predicted to be worse than the performance of the wild type. 
And then you no, or normally get this. You get a lot of genes that can be removed, and there's really no effect on the uh, growth state that you're trying to compute. So this is reflective of al alternate optimal solutions. There are qu equivalent optimal solutions uh, in the network. So you can remove a whole bunch of genes and get exactly the same growth state. So this is kind of measure of redundancy, if you will. So this is condition dependent. So the, the, the prediction of gene essentiality is condition dependent. So these predictions look different on glucose than on succinate. Now, you can actually detail these effects. <clears throat> so what is shown here on the left, on your right, is just a rotation of the graph I had before, <clears throat> where I just line the genes up, and uh, <clears throat> I plot out vertically the growth rate. Now, I can look at why <clears throat> a, a, a gene is essential. Why did it go to zero? And what is shown in the panel on the left are optimizations for each component of the biomass function. And I can identify which component of the biomass function cannot be made when that gene is gone. You can maybe make everything else, but if you cannot make that one uh, amino acid, say, it can't grow. This can, of course, be uh, tested experimentally by giving a supplement of that missing biomass component and reassessing experimentally the essentiality uh, of the gene product. So you, you can calculate much more than just the growth rate, the overall phenotype you're after, but you can parse it out often, like uh, shown in here. So the first calculation of this sort came out in the year 2000 with the uh, first genome scale model of E. coli. And uh, there are the results. We have the uh, lethal genes, uh, uh, essential genes. Um, uh, lined up, and then in yellow are the genes that are predicted to give a phenotype of uh, reduced growth rate, and then all these uh, blue columns there are corresponds to genes that are not predicted to affect the growth uh, materially. So this could be computed, and believe it or not, in the year 2000, it wasn't that easy to remove genes from E. coli. That technology was developed in the mid to late 80s, but fortunately at that time there were about 86 cases reported of gene knockouts uh, and viability under a series of growth conditions. So that table over there shows uh, four columns, which is growth on four different substrates, glucose, glycerol, succinated acetate, and then um, all the rows in this table show the different genes that were uh, knocked out of E. coli. And if you look, uh, if you look at the outcome, uh, of the prediction here. So there is experimental slash in silico. So there's a plus and a plus. Cell grows in silico, wild type cell grows. So there's a minus and a minus. You predict no growth and you measure no growth. So I think in this case, like, uh, what are the numbers there? 68 out of the 79 cases in this uh, table were correctly predicted, 86%, uh, which was actually an astonishing outcome that you could predict gene essentiality with that degree of accuracy with the genome scale model. But there are failure modes in here, like the ones highlighted in here, where you have a minus slash plus. So experimentally, they don't grow, but computationally, they do grow. So that's an example of a false positive prediction. So there are a few of them in there. And then you have also false negative predictions, where the model can't grow, but the cell actually grows. And those are the conditions uh, that are uh, used for gap filling, for instance, because that's indicative that there's something in the cell that is missing in the model because it can actually grow. All right, so that was the first set of predictions. Um, <clears throat> fortunately for yeast, there was a, early on, this is in 2003, uh, fortunately for yeast, there were many, many uh, knockout strains that were possible because of the genetics of yeast being easier. And this was the uh, first large scale assessment of the predictions of gene essentiality uh, by a genome scale model. And there were almost 600 knockout uh, cases examined in this case. And the uh, prediction accuracy here was just under 90%. So 9 out of 10 cases essentially were predicted correctly. And, and this result and the previous results also gave more credence to uh, genome scale models and their abilities to represent actual biology. Now, it turns out, uh, this table we, I guess we can't really read, but um, uh, there's a reconstruction of the mouse metabolic network, and the uh, uh, Jackson uh, lab has uh, a lot of uh, knockout strains uh, of mice. 
and you can analyze the uh, consequences of uh, metabolic knockouts here in a mammal and uh, relatively few cases but the prediction rates are actually pretty high they're in this 80 90 percent range which is uh, surprising okay so that's what you can do you can just put the flux to zero try to recompute and see what the outcome is and then you can go and compare those results to what you actually uh, can measure in the laboratory now you can actually also do multiple knockouts in silico and this is of course much easier to do uh, computationally than experimentally although I must say now with the new uh, genetic editing tools we'll probably be making you know large double knockout libraries and maybe triple knockout libraries and who knows what but in uh, silico this is pretty easy so on the top of this uh, panel here, we show uh, the outcome of single gene knockouts. You can take each one of the single gene knockout strains and then move all the other genes uh, and pair them up in that way. And then you get those predictions that are shown on the bottom. And uh, if you look at the yellow swath in that triangle uh, uh, below, uh, you see some red dots in there. Uh, those would be called uh, synthetic lethals. Um, this is where... Uh, the genes individually are not uh, lethal, but together they are. And synthetic lethality is of great interest in biology for a number of reasons. And we'll talk about some of them, I think, here or later on. So this you can generate. You can generate triple knockouts, you can quadruple knockouts, you can calculate a lot of knockouts easily, uh, but it's harder to make all the strains that correspond to these predictions. Now, you can have fun with things like this. Uh, this is also from the original E. coli paper, where the question was asked, um, can we kill or remove any DPH production? And uh, if you look at uh, the base solution you get when you're predicting growth, most of the NADPH comes from the pentose pathway. Well, we can remove now uh, uh, the gene that is boxed in there, uh, ZWF, or the uh, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, and incapacitate the oxidative branch of the uh, pentose pathway. And what happens then is that the cell switches NADH production to the transhydrogenase, and there's a very little drop in the growth. And then you can actually knock that out. You can knock out the uh, transhydrogenase, and now we switch the NAD uh, production to uh, the malic enzyme. There are two um, isoforms of the malic enzyme, one of which produces NADPH. Uh, then you knock on the malic enzyme, and then it dies. <laughs> so you can actually play with this to see how much you have to uh, remove from a cell to kill it. Uh, and this also speaks to the issue of network redundancy. A lot of thinking about gene essentiality at that time was focused on isozymes. So you knock one out, there's another isozyme for it. But this is a network version of that. You remove a function, and it can now be produced uh, somewhere else in the network. OK, so that's uh, the sort of thing you can do. You can take this to scale and look at K-synthetic lethals, where K is the number of genes you knock out. And uh, Costas Maranis at Penn State has um, gone the full nine yards here and calculated all K-synthetic lethals in genome scale models and show uh, the various uh, relationships between genes and the model when it comes to uh, synthetic uh, lethality. So if you're interested in stuff like that, this is very easy to do computationally. Okay, so what about the data? So we can uh, look at uh, uh, high throughput phenotypic screens with a collection of uh, knockout strains. And this was one early paper uh, uh, that uh, attempted to do this, and I think I may have shown this before. This is the work of Marcus Covert, who is now at Stanford, um, where he computed the outcome of uh, a genetic uh, uh, no, a, a cross between genetic parameters and environmental parameters. So the columns in this table are different uh, gene knockouts uh, in different gene categories, A, amino acids, and so forth. Then the rows are different nutritional environments where you take out the uh, carbon and nitrogen sources. Then you have the measured data that says gro no growth, no growth of the knockout strains under these conditions. And you can compute it, you can overlay the two. And this is just a binary comparison. 
And if they agree, you uh, color the uh, entry in the table uh, green. If they disagree, you color it red. And the, these yellow dots have to do with addition of regulatory events that I'm not going to describe here. And um, the, uh, here, I think the overall prediction rate is uh, on the order of 80%. And you see the failure rates in red have kind of band-like structures. They fail a lot, you know, like uh, uh, one nutritional environment, there's a lot of failures. And Jenny Reed um, at Wisconsin has looked at these failure modes and calculated the minimum number of additions to the model to make them go away. So one error can actually make, you know, dozens and dozens of red dots disappear. Okay, uh, so that's an example of that. Um, this is work that was done by the um, Novartis Genome Institute here in La Jolla with Andrew Joyce, where uh, E. coli was grown on just one condition on glucose, and all the genes were knocked out. Uh, the whole uh, library of knockouts was assessed on the glucose condition. And this here shows uh, you know, a detailed comparison of the experiments and the computation, and in this case, about 90% uh, prediction rate on the uh, consequence of gene knockouts. So uh, many, many studies like this have been done over the last 15 years. And this little uh, perspective here in science summarizes all of these results. Uh, so on um, the y-axis to the left is the number of phenotypes being looked at. And the top number there is 100,000. It's a log scale, 10,000, 1,000, and so forth. So the uh, uh, E. coli experiment that Marcus Coverts uh, analyzed that was about 13,000 uh, endpoints being predicted, just to give you a feeling for that scale. And the scale on the other side is the uh, uh, hit rate on the predictions. So the red line in this diagram shows the accuracy of the uh, uh, single knockout predictions, and the blue line, line, the double knockout prediction, synthetic lethality, which is considerably more difficult to predict, as it turns out. Now, 100,000 uh, points, uh, I think we'll soon have millions of double knockout strains of E. coli, and you can have millions of endpoints that you're predicting. This represents, I think, the largest attempt of computationally predicting phenotypic states. And the fact that the success rates are so high is quite comforting <clears throat> in the sense that the models that have been built are pretty well curated <clears throat> and comprehensive in their ability to describe <clears throat> the functions of an organism. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, <clears throat> now, these things lead to discovery, especially <clears throat> the double knockout uh, screens. Here is one example of that. <clears throat> this is a study that um, looked at um, a lot of uh, uh, double knockouts in yeast, and um, um, it shows um, three, so in this model there are three pathways to the synthesis of NAD, the, the cofactor NAD. When they were looking at synth the, the uh, um, prediction of synthetic lethality, they discovered that there were a lot of failure rates associated with the synthesis of this cofactor. And uh, you see in these three pathways, the one in pink, or reddish color, and blue, there's a lot of synthetic lethals discovered between these two pathways. So if you knock out genes in these two pathways, yeast tended not to grow. The yellow, uh, the pathway highlighted in yellow was put into the yeast model based on data from E. coli, and it was generally assumed that this pathway was active in all organisms. But these failure rates uh, led to the re-examination of that, and there was no genetic evidence uh, supporting the presence of this pathway uh, in the yeast model. So it had to be removed from it because it was included based on any organism-specific data. And now once it's removed, then all these uh, synthetic uh, lethal lethals are correctly predicted. So too much content was put into the yeast model uh, initially. Here's another example from uh, Eitan Rupin's lab in um, um, Israel, and I may have mentioned this before, but in many cancers there are metabolic lesions in the TCA cycle and it's incomplete. And what you can do is to calculate or predict all synthetic lethals 
that pair up with that lesion that's in the cancer cell, uh, but not the normal cells. So that if you can use the other half or the paired up target with the one that's already in the tumor cell, you may have a drug target that will just kill the tumor cells and not normal cells. And this study showed the discovery of synthetic lethal pairs between fumarate dehydrase in the TCA cycle and heme biosyn the heme biosynthetic pathway, which seems like an outlandish prediction in the beginning. I mean, how would you know inhibiting heme biosynthesis uh, kill a cancer cell? But it turned out to be the case because uh, all the Ritos uh, um, equivalents generated in the TCA cycle had to be dumped onto heme uh, biosynthesis that consumes a lot of uh, Ritos equivalents. And of course, heme was overproduced, converted into bilirubin, and that was one of the predictions that the bilirubin would be found in urine or in blood, um, and that turned out to be the case. So this is a, an astonishing example uh, resulting from uh, using uh, synthetic lethal calculations. So let me then say a few things about uh, the prediction of gene knockouts that does not lead to a lethal phenotype, but a phenotype that is altered. And the minimization of metabolic adjustment was the first method that came out to uh, uh, predict what the phenotypic state would be after the knockout of a gene. And the prediction just is that the network uh, moves as little away from its original phenotypic state uh, as possible. And here's the way this is uh, 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 illustrated. So here is uh, the growth rate as a function of a parameter, and there's an optimal uh, solution you can calculate there using FBA. Now, if you knock out the gene, uh, the solution space will be smaller, and it's uh, illustrated here in green. So if you do an FBA calculation here of an optimal growth rate, you would calculate this point. But there's no reason to expect that the uh, knockout strain is uh, optimal in any sense. And MoMA uh, does a prediction based on Euclidean distance where it maps that the red dot that was the original phenotype onto the reduced solution space and uses the criteria of the shortest distance. So it's a mathematical criteria. And uh, uh, um, so if you were to get a uh, phenotype from a gene knockout and hit that yellow dot, uh, then subsequent evolution of that dot should evolve it uh, to the red dot within the green space. So there are two predictions that are uh, embedded in here. First the yellow dot, and then that second green uh, uh, red dot. So experiments have been done to uh, address this, and they are shown here, where cellular growth rate is on the y-axis in these uh, panels, and the x-axis is the day of adaptation. And this is um, a series of uh, a gene knockouts that are represented in here, and a series of substrates uh, that are tested for growth. And you see these uh, evolutionary trajectories um, start from a low point typically, a low growth rate, and they increase. So you can get the first growth rate, which, which should be predicted by MoMA, and then the end growth rate that should be predicted by FBA. And that little panel in the top uh, uh, left shows uh, the uh, comparison of measured growth rate and the predicted growth rate. And the blue dots are the starting points, which will be the MoMA predictions, and the pink dots are the end points, which are the FBA predictions. So these kind of studies have actually shown that um, um, uh, these sorts of predictions, and this is pretty rigorous uh, a test of a predict uh, these sorts of predictions, uh, they hold up pretty well by and large, not always, but they're often uh, dead on. And I think in that you know, panel on the top uh, left, uh, I guess about f almost 40, say 40 out of 50 or 80 percent or so of these predictions come out to be uh, accurate. I just thought I should put this up um, to show you just the mathematical formulation of MoMA. You see the, uh, uh, this is a QP problem, and you know, under the square root, uh, you know, you're calculating the Euclidean length as a second order function, and then you square, take the square root of that. And that's your objective function that you're minimizing. So it's a non-linear objective function. And the nice thing about MoMA is that the yellow dot is unique. When you fix the uh, point you're projecting, it's an orthogonal projection onto the solution space, and it's the shortest distance. It is a unique prediction, which is nice. However, the challenge with this is that the point that you're pro projecting from may not be unique. 
remember the, uh, you know, you can have alternative uh, optimal solutions. So which ones do you project? Um, and that has actually, that question has actually been addressed where you can take, you know, a wild type cell grown on a particular substrate and not in for strict optimality, but maybe 85% of optimal growth rate. And you can calculate a bunch of growth states there. And then you can project them uh, based on a knockout, in this case, based on malate dehydrogenase, uh, and look at the MoMA predictions. You can just now plot the predicted growth rate as a function of the starting point. And you can generate histograms that look like this. So you don't get a single pr prediction, but you take a, an assembly of points that you think represent your uh, phenotype and kind of maybe variations therein, and then you project that. And sometimes those histograms are narrow, which means that the prediction is kind of precise. Sometimes they may be wide. So it, those MoMA predictions may or, not, may or not be that reliable. So that's an example of that. OK. Um, so the MoMA summary, this has been used so much, it's worth uh, saying a few things about it. So this is a method for quantitatively predicting a flux state uh, following a gene knockout. Um, and it's uh, based on uh, minimizing a distance metric, which in this case is a Euclidean distance. It does require a starting point um, to uh, uh, project from, and that may not be unique, so you may have to sample that and have a few of them. Um, and therefore, you know, the alternate optima in the wild type have to be taken into account. <coughs> People have also used other distance metrics. So this uses the Euclidean distance. If you use just the Manhattan norm, the absolute length of the vector, you actually end up with an LP problem because that's a linear objective function. Um, people have calculated other things. They've used the uh, uh, Hamming distance where they kind of calculate the minimum number of fluxes that have to be changed to get to the, to the solution space. So the minimum number of gene expression of regulatory events. Uh, that's a method called regulatory off-on minimization or room. So that's an MILP type procedure. So people have played with different uh, distance metrics to look at this. Now MoMA can be used to analyze other things like minimization of a flux state when you shift from one growth rate to another. And there's a, uh, some papers that have used MoMA for those sorts of things. So it's a, it's a useful, you know, it's a useful way to try to measure the distance between two states. And the distance metric can be uh, varied. So i um, not going to say more about um, the mapping methods that are used uh, for uh, uh, predicting viable phenotypes. But, you know, phenotypes that are not as good as the wild type as a consequence of gene knockout. Let me now just take three or four minutes to walk through other types of applications that you can do, uh, other types of applications uh, you can look at <coughs> um, uh, by specifying genetic parameters. We just looked at whole gene knockouts here, lethal phenotypes or a retarded growth phenotype. But there are many, many other genetic parameters you can map. So SNPs, for instance. So we... Um, um, like to, um, we, we try to, we are, well, a part of uh, the effort to find <clears throat> the genetic basis for human disease is to figure out all the SNPs that uh, correlate with that disease. And for instance, there are many genetic alterations involved in uh, obesity or diabetes, as an example. So how can we understand alternate SNPs that cause the same phenotypic state? So that can be done by calculating cosets, okay? So we, I, we may have mentioned this in an earlier lecture, but uh, you can look at, um, by different methods, look at the um, co-use uh, of fluxes in a network. In other words, you look at all of its phenotypic states and you see if the, the, the fluxes are correlated in some sense. So for instance, if you have a linear pathway that is always used or not used, Either all the genes are used or they are not used, so they all correlate. And you can look at all the genes that encode such a coset, and then a SNP in any one of those genes would have the same effect on the phenotype because it would alter that coset. 
And here are some uh, three types of co-sets, uh, <coughs> fundamental types of co-sets that have been elucidated. One is for a multimeric protein, so there are maybe four genes, but one uh, tetramer, heterotetramer, so genes, mutations in any one of the components of that uh, tetramer would have the same effect on the network state. In the middle, we are showing a linear pathway. So all the genes that encode components of protein catalyzing that linear pathway can, in principle, throttle that flux down uh, and, and be responsible for that type of an inborn error in metabolism. But then there are the discontiguous co-sets that are hard to see just by looking at a map, but you can calculate them. Uh, in the simple case of that would be an input into a branch pathway that converges again, then the input and the output are, they always have to be active at the same time, but uh, the members of the two pathways may or may not. So you can calculate this. This is an example of such a calculation for the original reconstruction of the human mitochondria in the cardiac myocyte. All these type of cosets were found, and this is work by uh, Nima Jamshidi, um, who is a radiologist now up at UCLA. The type A coset is associated with suction dehydrogenase, and uh, many mutations in the components of it lead to uh, the same phenotype, so-called Lee syndrome, uh, which is a retarded uh, ability of the uh, uh, oxidative phosphorylation. There's a type B coset in here. This is the biosynthetic pathway for heme. Uh, and uh, there's a number of um, mutations that have been found in the genes of this pathway, and they all result in the same phenotype that results from you know, too little hemoglobin, uh, too little heme, I should say, not necessarily hemoglobin. The hemes are put into the cytochromes also, of course. And then there is this um, discontiguous coset here of type C that is associated with the urea cycle, and mutations in these genes have been uh, associated with uh, mental retardation um, due to uh, problems during development. Um, uh, the brain is very sensitive to metabolic imbalances uh, as it develops. So uh, this is one way of trying to correlate uh, uh, genetic parameters, SNPs, through network properties. Okay. Uh, epigenetics, so we'll talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> so this was fascinating to me to learn that uh, males and females, so uh, moms and dads, actually compete at the genetic level. Moms try to silence certain alleles from the dad and vice versa. For instance, uh, it's evolutionary advantageous to ma for males to have big strong offsprings because they can have them with many uh, women. Whereas a woman would uh, you know, have to spend a lot of her resources if she has one big child, so would rather have you know, maybe smaller children and be able to raise many of them rather than a few big ones. And so, <clears throat> but I find that so interesting. It's kind of, um, it's called uh, the uh, Hastings theory, I think, uh, uh, or something like that. And so let's look at that. <clears throat> Here is a normal situation in a diploid organism. Uh, where both alleles, both the paternal and the maternal, are expressed. <clears throat> and let's say um, you would have uh, two genes of interest there uh, 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 that, could, that could be imprinted, uh, one related to one pathway and another pathway, so R1 and R2. And you can actually uh, define by using FVA, an envelope of allowable states, compared on your constraining parameters. Here would be uh, what's called an epigenotype 2, <clears throat> where a loss of imprinting has happened, and now the gene dosage basically doubles. Now you have much more of this protein around, and you can predict based on that <clears throat> that some pathways may now be more active as a result of that. <clears throat> and the FEA swather uh, changes a little bit in shape. And then you can look at the uh, opposite, where you actually lose <clears throat> the expression of that one allele that was active, and then you have a substantial effect on that uh, FVA uh, envelope. There are something like uh, nine known imprinted genes uh, in Recon 1, and uh, in this little uh, paper that I just looked at here at the bottom, uh, Recon 1 is used to calculate the likely metabolic uh, uh, disturbance or, or how the uh, metabolic state wobbles as a result of loss of imprinting. And it's very consistent <clears throat> with the uh, uh, characteristics of people that have that loss of imprinting. So here's a completely different genetic parameter that one, one can look at. 
And finally, <clears throat> inborn errors in metabolism. <clears throat> if there are reduced capabilities of enzymes in human cells, sometimes the outputs are different. You know, what, what, the, what metabolites a cell secretes may differ as a function of those genetic parameters. And this is a table from the Recon uh, 2 uh, paper that predicts uh, biomarkers in plasma as a consequence of inborn errors in metabolism. And uh, <clears throat> um, I guess uh, the red and the green predict whether a metabolite is predicted to go up or down. And then these uh, hatch marks through there uh, indicate whether the prediction is correct or not. And that's summarized in these little tables on top that you can't read. But if you look at the paper, you will see that these predictions are actually surprisingly good. So here's another set of genetic parameters that you can map onto a reconstruction and make meaningful predictions. All right, <clears throat> so let's summarize. <clears throat> so genome scale reconstructions give us a framework to assess genetic parameters. And this is done because every reaction has a genetic basis in the model. And therefore, you can trace that relationship. You can, any, any alteration in a genetic property is directly reflected in the activity of a link uh, in your network. So a variety of parameters can be studied. So gene deletions, like we talked about, uh, those are uh, relatively easy to do. Epistasis, or you know, like synthetic lethals, interactions between genes can be studied. We can map uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, as we showed, that, and try to correlate those. Gene dosage, this is um, as a result of imprinting or loss of imprinting, or, for instance, in cancer, sometimes you have aneuploidy, you have segmental duplications of a big piece of the chromosome. Now you have a lot of different copies of that gene, and that is believed to be um, the causative effect uh, in cancer, that somehow the proteome is wobbled. It's not necessarily mutated, but it just goes out of balance because there is an incorrect um, amount of certain protein being expressed. As you have seen from uh, the limited number of examples picked in this uh, lecture, uh, you can really uh, productively study the consequences of genetic traits if you have a, a well-curated model of your um, target organism. And that is the end. <clears throat>